Okay, so we're still talking about chi-square tests for homogeneity in section 11.2. The first part asks, can you use your calculator to do a chi-square test for homogeneity? And the answer is yes, you absolutely can. It's not the goodness of fit one, it's just the plain old chi-square test option. So if you hit stat, tests, and then chi-square test, the more general version here, that's what we're going to use for homogeneity. So on my calculator here, if I go to stat, over to tests, uh, there's two chi-square options. There's either chi-square test, which that's the one we want, or chi-square goodness of fit test. That's the more basic one for a one-way table from the last section. Okay, and if I select chi-square test, I'm going to hit enter here, it asks for the observed counts and the expected counts, but this isn't L1 and L2 anymore. Right? L1 and L2 are actually just one-dimensional, so these are actually matrices. Matrix A and matrix B. So since we're dealing with two-way tables now, we've got to store our observed counts and our expected counts in a matrix. So on our calculator, we're going to go to second and then the matrix button, second matrix, and then we're going to put our observed counts in matrix A and our expected counts in matrix B. And we'll do that with the example here in just a moment. So when it gets to down to the do step, what do you actually need, right? This is state, plan, do, conclude. And the do step is usually where we implement the technology. And similar to what we've done in the past, I need to see the test statistic. In this case, it's not a T-score or a Z-score. It's our chi-square test statistic. I need the degrees of freedom and the p-value. So when we get to the do step, I need those three things, which means you can use your calculator all day. So the first example was inspired by the does background music influence what customers buy example. It says a statistics student decided to investigate other ways to influence a person's behavior. Using 60 volunteers, she randomly assigned 20 volunteers to get the red survey, 20 volunteers to get the blue survey, and 20 volunteers to get a control survey. The first three questions on each survey were the same, but the fourth and fifth questions were different. For example, the fourth question on the red survey was, when you think of the color red, what do you think about? On the blue survey, the question replaced red with blue. On the control survey, the questions were not about color. As a reward, the student let each volunteer choose a chocolate candy in a red wrapper or a chocolate candy in a blue wrapper. Here are the results. So we can organize the results in a two-way table Looks like 20 total people were assigned to the red survey, 20 assigned to the blue, 20 assigned to the control, and then after the survey, like the people that did the red survey, 13 chose a red candy, 7 chose a blue candy. For the blue survey, only 5 chose a red candy, 15 chose a blue candy. In the control, it was 8 and 12 for red to blue. So the question then is, do these data actually provide convincing evidence at the alpha equals 0.05 level that the true distributions of color choice are different for the three types of surveys. I mean, just by glancing at the numbers, they look somewhat different, but is that statistically significant, right? Can we prove that statistically? So if it asks for us to provide convincing evidence, that's our cue to do a significance test. So let's go ahead and start with the state step. So as always, we want to test two hypotheses, our null hypothesis, and our alternative hypothesis. Remember, the null always says that things are the same. There's no difference. And then the alternative tries to suggest some sort of difference. So in context, for the null, we can say there's no difference in the true distributions of color choices for people who get the red or the blue or the control survey. So that's the null. There's no difference and the true distributions. And the alternative just says there is a difference. And I just put the quote marks again because I don't want to write that all out. If this were the AP exam, of course I would, but for now, you get the picture. The alternative just says there actually is a difference between these three somewhere. And we're actually given the alpha level here. I feel like that's a rare occurrence, but alpha 0.05 is what we're going to use. All right, so the state step is good. We got our hypotheses, 
we use context, and we mention the alpha level. Let's go ahead and get to the plan step. So we're going to plan to do a test. So let's name the type of test that we're going to run. So if the conditions are met, it's not just a chi-square test. We have to actually be specific. Is it goodness of fit, homogeneity? And the other one we'll, that we'll do after this is for independence. So this one, just like the title of the notes suggests, is a chi-square test for homogeneity. So there's our first point. Can we actually name the test that we're going to run? And then the next three points for this problem, let's meet all three conditions. So the randomness condition should be good because it's said in the problem that the three treatments were randomly assigned to subjects. Okay, and what about the independence condition? One thing I want to point out here, the 10% condition does not apply in this case. And in general, it typically doesn't apply to experiments because it's not like we randomly sampled people from some greater population. It was just the volunteers who signed up to be in this experiment. So since we didn't get a random sample of people to be in the experiment, right, we just had people sign up and then we assigned them to treatments, the 10% the condition doesn't apply. But we can still make a note and say, well, as far as independence is concerned, in an experiment like this, the responses of the participants should be independent of each other. As long as people aren't interacting with each other, the color of candy that they choose at the end of their survey should be totally independent of everyone else. Otherwise, it would be incorrect to mention anything about the 10% condition here. That's only when we're randomly sampling from a larger population. This one didn't happen like that. Experiments, for the most part, they just have volunteers that sign up to participate. Okay, and the last condition has to do with our expected counts. Expected counts. In fact, we have to show that they're all at least five. And I made the table big enough for this example that we can put them in each cell. And let's go ahead and make them the circled values. So we're going to put the expected counts up here. They'll be the circled numbers. So let's start with the first cell. The observed count, people that had the red survey as their treatment and chose the red candy was 13. That was the number observed. The expected count for that cell, remember, we do the row total. 26, times the column total, which would be 20, divided by the table total, the overall total here, which would be 60, which gives us our expected count for this cell of 8.67. So I'm going to put 8.67 in there, circle it, and then I'm going to move on. The one below that, use the same method, 11.33 for this guy, for this cell, and then you should start to notice a pattern. So the next one, up top here, 8.67, because the row total and the column total should be the same as they were for that cell. And then 11.33, 8.67, 11 11.3. So we've got all of our expected counts. And we just need to make a note saying, hey, look in the table above. There's our expected counts. Oh, and by the way, they're all at least five. So that condition is met. Check mark. Okay, so the plan step's good. We named the test that we're going to run. We met all three conditions. Now let's go to the do step. So we mentioned this at the beginning of the notes. For the do step, we just need to see what's the test statistic, the degrees of freedom used for that chi-square value, the test statistic, and the p-value. So we're going to take a crack at this technology thing. We're going to try this calculator command out. So we can say using technology, the command chi-square test is actually going to give us all three of these things. And again, here's the chi-square test command. I just need to go to matrix A and put my observed counts, and then matrix B to put my expected counts. So how do we get to these matrices is the question. Well, like I said, if you hit seconds and then the X to the negative 1 button right there, you see in blue it says matrix. <clears throat> That's what we're going to go to. So there's all of the matrices. You go second, and then it's x to the negative 1. That's the matrix option. And then we're going to need to edit these matrices. So let's go over to edit. And then once you go over to edit, hit enter. We're going to edit matrix A. So right now it's a one-by-one one matrix, which means it's just one cell. 
And so this goes rows by columns. And if you look at the two-way table, it's two rows by three columns. So it's a two by three matrix. The organization of this matrix, the structure, should match whatever two-way table you're using. Okay, and we said matrix A was going to be the observed count. So let's start with 13 is the first one. And then we've got 5, and then 8, 7, 15, and 12. So that matches our two-way table exactly for the observed counts. Okay, so matrix A is all good. Now let's go ahead and go back to matrix B. So let's go edit matrix B. Matrix B starts out as a one by one also. So again, let's make it a two by three and enter our expected counts. So we just calculated these. It was 8.67, another 8.67, one more 8.67 up top there, and then 11.33 for the bottom row each cell. All right, so matrix B is all good. Those are our expected counts. Now I'm just going to go quit, get back to my home screen. So second quit, or second mode, back to the home screen. And let's go get that stat test option again. So we're going to go stat, test, and then chi-square test. Not the GOF one. That was last section. So it's just chi-square test. Okay, so now once I select chi-square test, it's going to say observed in matrix A, expected in matrix B, Check, check. We already did both of those things. So let's go ahead and calculate. And there it is. Beautiful. Chi-square, the test statistic, 6.65. The p-value, 0 0.0359. And degrees of freedom, 2. So we've got our test statistic. Chi-square is 6.65, which uses 2 degrees of freedom. And our p-value is 0 0.0359. So all three of those things, that'll get us full credit um, for the do step. Lastly, we just need to conclude. So our p-value is actually below that 0.05 level, so we have to mention why we're going to reject the null hypothesis. We can say because our p-value of 0 0.0359 is less than alpha, which is 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. And then finally, we just have to say what that means exactly in context. If we reject the null, that means we've got convincing evidence that there is a difference, and then now we have to add the context piece. There is a difference in the true distributions of color for people who get the red, the blue, or the control survey. So not only did those values look different, but we proved that that difference was statistically significant. Okay, so we're done with that part of the notes. The next part here says, how do you conduct a follow-up analysis for a test of homogeneity? Well, the idea is actually the same as the follow-up analysis for a goodness of fit test. You just want to describe what category or what cell ended up being the biggest contributor to that chi-square test statistic. And also, like how did it contribute? Was the value above or below the expected count? Keep in mind, you only have to do this when you're specifically asked to. So how we just did a significance test, we would have stopped at the conclude part. We wouldn't, we wouldn't give a follow-up analysis unless we were specifically asked to do so. So let's talk about the chi-square test statistic. In the last example that we just did, it was 6.65. So our calculator actually went through and did this for us, but our calculator did the observed minus the expected, squared it, divided by the expected. It went through and did that for each one of those values, for each cell on that table. And that's where it got the 6.65 from. So in a follow-up analysis, we want to know what the largest contributor was. In this case, it's actually the very first one, the 13. But how the heck are you ever going to know that if you don't actually go through and calculate each one by hand? That's a great question. 
So I got a little bit lazy and I put dot, dot, dot. Who's to say that there wasn't a bigger one in there somewhere? And then fortunately, here's the results of our test in our calculator. The calculator isn't willing to share that knowledge at the moment either. It's not going to tell you right away what the biggest contributor was. Although it did do that for the goodness of fit test, but unfortunately it doesn't do that here. So if you want to calculate each one by hand, feel free. Um, I'm going to show you a method to let your calculator do that as well using your lists L1, L2, and then L3. So I'm going to edit those lists by going to Stat and then hitting Edit. And then in L1, if you would go ahead and just throw in the observed counts from the two-way table, 13, 5, 8, and so on. And then their corresponding expected counts in L2. So the 8.67 for the first three, and then 11.33 for the last three. And so we want to know how much each one of these contributes to that chi-square test statistic. So we're actually going to go up to L3 here, highlight L3. And we're going to tell L3 to do the observed minus the expected squared. So I'm going to do parentheses, L1, the observed, minus L2, the expected, and then square that difference, and then divide that by the expected, which is L2. So that's exactly what that chi-square formula was. Observed minus expected, square the difference, divide by expected. Let's go ahead and enter. And you'll notice I got some weird decimals here. Actually, if you sum these up, that's where your calculator gets that 6.65 number from. Well, now it's obvious to us which one the biggest difference came from, and that's the 2.1625. That's bigger than any of these numbers. So we can say, oh, the 13, that observed value, contributed the most to our chi-square. Again, if you went ahead and added all these up, that's where you'd get that 6.65 chi-square value from. Okay, so that 13 was in the top left cell, which is the red candy and red survey. People that chose the red candy after getting the red survey treatment. That actually contributed the most to our chi-square test statistic, which was 6.65. And why was that? Well, the, the observed counts was 4.33 candies more than the expected count. How the heck did I get that number? The observed count was 4.33 candies more than the expected count. Well, if I just go back and look at the expected count here, 13 is way bigger than 8.67. In fact, it's 4.33 candies more. Which actually contributed 2.163 to our chi-square test statistic. And just as a reminder, you don't have to do a follow-up analysis unless you're specifically asked to. That's when you would say who the biggest contributor was, how much did they contribute, and were they above or below the expected count. All right, I hope you learned a couple calculator tricks and a thing or two about chi-square tests for homogeneity. That's all for these notes. I'll see you in class.